Good evening, everybody. My name is Campbell Forrest. I'm a member of uh, Council of the Society. Although tempered a bit by the fact that we can't all be together in a live meeting, it's a real pleasure to chair this evening's meeting with Tamsin Mather. Tamsin, of course, was the first casualty of the pandemic in terms of speaking to the Royal Phil, at least. Um, and she's, we're extremely grateful to her agreeing to do the first presentation of this new season. Tamsin is Professor of Earth Sciences at the University of Oxford, and her main research interests lie in the field of volcanoes and volcanic behaviour as natural hazards, as a key planetary scale process throughout geological time, vital for maintaining habitability, and as natural resources. She is an esteemed academic, highly successful in attracting research funding and has many publications. Her advice has been sought by governments and policymakers in the UK and internationally. She has received numerous honours and awards, one of the most recent being the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award. And I'd like to highlight her extensive outreach work, including with the BBC. This has included improving the accessibility of science to children and in promoting the role of women in science. Now, in January of this year, the Society, by dint of chance, or as we prefer to think, superb planning, arranged a presentation by Professor Wendy Barclay of Imperial College, and the subject, the next influenza epidemic. Then on the 3rd of March, an influential book by the moral philosopher Toby Ord was published. It is called The Precipice, and it examines existential risk and the future of humanity. He reviews many types of risk and calculates that the risk of existential catastrophe via naturally arising pandemics is of the same order as via super volcanic eruption. We sincerely hope, Tamsin, that the society's predictive track record does not extend quite so rapidly to the subject of this evening's presentation, which is volcanoes from fuming vents to extinction events. Over to you, Tamsin. Thank you very much, Campbell, and thank you very much for, uh, for that introduction. I'm, I'm just going to move now to share my screen and get into presentation mode. I hope that, uh, that looks okay. Um, so I'm going to talk today about volcanoes from fuming vents to extinction events. Um, I'm really, really disappointed not to be with you up in Glasgow uh, this evening. Um, obviously, uh, lots and lots of disappointment around, but I was really, really looking forward to the trip and, and to meeting you all and, uh, and to uh, having the interactions that really we, we could only have face to face. But obviously, we're all getting um, we're all getting used to this sort of new new normal and this new Zoom environment. And I believe I am the first speaker in your society's long and illustrious history to speak remotely or to speak over over something such as Zoom. So I felt like I ought to sort of start off by marking this. So I thought I'd share with you a little story from early in lockdown when I first started trying to use Zoom, um, and my first attempt to use a virtual background. Uh, in Zoom, which is actually the same virtual background that I have uh, on display tonight, which is from the Etna 2001 eruption. But anyway, this is my first attempt to, to use a virtual background in Zoom, and uh, I thought it was quite amusing. It was, uh, it was on a, a call to other volcanologists, and everyone was quite taken with what I'd become. So I put this up on Twitter and just said, fair to say, I've not entirely mastered the virtual background feature on Zoom. Um, I got some quite pleasing results. So, you know, one of my colleagues in the States sort of, sort of said a, she saw a Zoom meeting with a, be um, a meeting with a being of unspeakable power, which is the first time I have been uh, referred to like that in a meeting. So I thought that was a reasonable result. Uh, someone else thought maybe I was one of the X-Men and Zoom was able to spew, spot mutant genes. Um, and then another of my colleagues thought that she couldn't think of a better deity to teach volcanology. I also got a few comparisons with various monsters. So this is a monster from uh, a demon uh, from uh, the TV series, The Good Place. Uh, the lava monster from the Disney film Moana. And then of course, Lord of the Rings. And there's Gandalf saying, go back to the shadows, you shall not pass. Um, slightly more disappointingly was the response from my colleague in Durham, Colin McPherson. Um, and this was his first thought. I think this is the, the least said about that, the better. 
But anyway, I have now, I'm pleased to say, if lockdown has given us nothing else, I have mastered the virtual background feature on Zoom. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a silver lining in every cloud, I guess. So back to this, uh, this picture here, and this is actually um, one of my uh, favorite pictures of volcanoes, although there are a lot of favorite pictures. Um, and this is, of course, from the Arafat Yerkut eruption in 2010. Um, and the reason I, I do like to start with this is it often brings, brings to people uh, sitting in the United Kingdom the, the relevance of volcanology for their everyday lives. So I can't kind of cast my eye around the, the room and ask for a show of hands, but I, I would put money on the fact that at least one person uh, in this call has was, uh, had travel pl plans affected by this 2010 eruption. Of course, it all seems a little trivial now with the, the general lockdown of travel that we're experiencing right now. Um, it's also, uh, it's also um, a very uh, interesting eruption um, in terms of where it's located. So it's a, hazard, a hazardous eruption. The reason all those planes were, were grounded is because of the, the hazard from this, this ash cloud coming over airspace and potentially planes dropping out of the sky. But actually in the local, in the local Icelandic um, in, uh, area where it was based, it wasn't very hazardous at all. It was quite a, a low key, small, moderate eruption. Um, but the fact that it's based in Iceland also gives me a chance to sort of speak about volcanoes in a different way. So volcanoes are hazards, but actually Iceland's a country that gets a very significant percentage of its power from geothermal power associated with the, the volcanism uh, that, has, that has built its country as well. So volcanoes have this sort of already had this sort of dual personality embedded in them. They're both hazards, but also resources that we use as humans. Um, and the other aspect of volcanology that really, really deep, 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 deeply fascinates me is actually what uh, Campbell was saying in terms of their role as a planetary scale process. That basically their role in forming the planet that we see around us today. Uh, and fundamentally, I, I guess um, ourselves as human beings and our ability to sort of sit here and wonder uh, about volcanoes and, and other, other parts of, uh, of the wonderful world that we inhabit. I guess in this picture, this is symbolized by this bolt of volcanic lightning. It's not a, um, it, it's, no, it's no coincidence that the lightning is there. It's actually generated from a, some of the processes going on in the plume. But uh, this bolt of, of, of volcanic lightning just reminds me to sort of say about the interaction because it's actually one of the candidates for forming some of the molecules uh, crucial for life to actually evolve on, pla on the planet is this sort of this, this, these high temperatures that you get in this, in this, um, in these bolts of volcanic lightning. So really, this is what fascinates me about volcanoes: is they, they, they have all these different facets to them, and the science around all these different facets to them is really, really very interesting. Um, and what I'm really going to focus on today is actually their kind of one of their roles in the geological timescale. So what I want to sort of convince you of today is that by sitting in, uh, in, in making measurements in a, the fumes from a volcanic vent, we can actually get insights into some of the most fundamental um, uh, uh, events back in, uh, back in geological history, uh, obviously, namely extinction events. So this has kind of been a, um, uh, hang on, for some reason it's not wanting to, oh, there we go. Um, this has been sort of something of a personal journey for me. So I started uh, my PhD back in 2001. And this is me on my very first uh, field trip ever to Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua um, in 2001. So here I am with all my kit here measuring essentially some of the fumes coming out of the, uh, of the volcano here to understand what's going on. Uh, and you might like look at this picture and uh, think it looks pretty terrifying. You know, I've got an enormous gaping crater in the background here with gas, uh, hazy gas seeping out of it. Uh, I personally find this image quite terrifying these days for completely different reasons, which is, which is basically how young I look uh, in this, this image now. It uh, really reminds me of the passing of human time, not ge just geological time. Um, so here I am making my measurements. You can see here I'm hard at work. Sometimes we have to leave the measurements uh, running for quite a long time and in the sun, the heat and your gas mask, you can kind of doze off for a bit and um, have a rest. And this is what I was peering in at when I was uh, looking over, uh, making my measurements into the volcano. And you can see this gas coming out of here. And I guess uh, one of the reasons that I was studying this gas here was about the hazard of the volcano, trying to understand what's going on deep inside its guts, if you like. 
Um, but actually, another thing that was, which was, uh, which was very much the focus of my PhD, was also looking outwards from the volcano, and uh, looking at this this gas cloud coming out here, and thinking about how it interacted with with the local environment, and then of course the the global environment as well. Um, and that's what it looked like back in 2001, but the Sao Volcano is changing all the time. So I just wanted to show you a little video clip from the last time I was there in 2017, just to give you an idea of what's actually going on down that vent. Uh, so this is the first time that, uh, that I'd seen this uh, and it was really quite exciting. So you can see how energetic the magma is that was hidden from us in 2001. And you see these bursts and these slugs of gas coming out of, the, uh, out of the magma there. You can see a few bursting up there, very, very dynamic situation, almost like a kind of fiery blowhole looking down onto the sea um, during, a, during a storm. Um, so this, this gas is being brought out from inside our planet um, through this, this conduit, through this volcano, uh, and then drifting off out into the environment. So the other thing, uh, that was the, the first year of my PhD. So I started sort of making measurements and in, of volcanic vents and thinking about what was coming out of the volcanoes and how to understand them better. But actually in the last year of my PhD, I, I attended a lecture um, in Cambridge, um, one of the Darwin lectures. And, um, and for the first time I saw this very influential graph that really kind of embedded in my mind. Um, and this was a talk given by a, a French scientist called Vincent Courtier from, uh, from IPGP the, uh, in, in Paris. And um, basically his talk was, was all about uh, catastrophes in the evolution of earth and life. Um, and namely about the connection between uh, these catastrophes and volcanism. So what this plot that he put up in that in that talk has here is it has on this axis, this is a geological time scale going from zero, so that's present day, to 300 million years or, on both axes. Um, and what he was plotting here were the ages of extinction events in the in the Earth record. So these are these these different extinction events here um, named along in this section here against the age of volcanic traps. And we're going to talk. I'm going to talk a bit more in, in in this lecture, really, about what both these what both these terms mean. But just to pick out one that you you might have you, you're most likely to have heard of. So this this end Cretaceous event here um, is the one that's that's most famous uh, for people, uh, and that's largely because it's the it's one of the most it's the most recent one, but also because of the demise of the dinosaurs. Uh, this this uh, this blob on a graph here basically is is indicating where the where the dinosaurs um, went extinct. Of course, you can find some great um, great cartoons on the internet. There's a lot of debate. There's is still a lot of debate about what killed the dinosaurs, and you might have heard the kind of was it was it volcanoes or was it uh, an asteroid impact? Which is why I put this this uh, this asteroid emoji type thing here. Um, and if you look on the internet, you can find sort of cartoons like, hey, Arthur, check it out, shooting star. That's a sure sign, sure sign of good, good luck, my friend. Of course, it turned out not to be so much good luck for the dinosaurs, uh, unfortunately for them, probably fortunately for us. Um, but, um, but you can also find uh, various uh, uh, suggestions also that actually the demise of the dinosaurs was intimately linked with this, this, these traps here, the, the Deccan traps. Um, and this this debate is is still is still very current today, um, and just to sort of talk a little bit through what this type of volcanism, what this traps, this volcanic traps type of volcanism is like. So we often call this large igneous provinces. I'm going to kind of in a second sort of cite that within the types of volcanic activity that you might be more accustomed to or more used to. Um, but this is really volcanism on a scale that we have not seen in the historical record. The most recent example of this is the Columbia River flood basalts, and that was 17 million years ago. So we, we don't we don't have a um, we don't we have no sort of historical in on how to understand this. If you go and look at these these uh, these traps, basically they cover absolutely enormous areas. So this is the Deccan traps. This is the subcontinent of India here. And this is the area just covered by the, the, the sub area, not the submarine, the land-based part of the Deccan trap. So you can see it broken up a little bit more in terms of how it fits in with, uh, with, with India just here. And there's Mumbai in order to orientate you. 
But if you go look at these in the field, they're just there pile upon pile upon pile of lava flow. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale, this, this wonderful image here, unfortunately, of the Deccan doesn't have a scale in it. So I put this Columbia River. There's a, a, a bus, a coach there, and a kind of barn as well, just to give you a sense of the scale. So layer upon layer, layer upon layer of lava flow has built up uh, over time to make these massive, uh, massive types of scenery and topography. Um, and if you look at them, they, they, they have some sort of shared characteristics, but just to take the Deccan, for example, uh, the Deccan traps basically put out about a half a million cubic kilometers of lava onto the surface of our planet. So that's a really difficult uh, thing to get your, your head around. But just to give you an idea of what a cubic kilometer of lava would look like, I did a quick calculation. And I think uh, if, I, if I'm correct, a cubic kilometer, just one cubic kilometer of lava would actually bury the whole of Glasgow under six meters of, la of lava. Um, on the same, the same volume of, of lava would actually bury all of Greater London, London under 60 centimetres of, uh, of, of, of lava, or the whole of Wales, which, uh, which, which apparently is sometimes used as the unit of catastrophe, um, under five centimetres depth of, of lava. So this gives you a scale of the volumes that we're talking about. Um, and they also put out... Uh, enormous quantities of volcanic gases. So I'll come back to sulfur dioxide and what it means later. Um, and most of this activity is focused within about 1 million years, which sounds like a, it's a, it sounds like a very long time, but this is over a sort of geological time scale. So these, these are enormous episodes. These are enormous elevated episodes uh, in terms of how much, uh, how much volcanism is going on on our planet during these sort of one, 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 million, year ep one million year episodes. Um, and the Deccan is not alone. So here is the, the Deccan traps here again. So you can see that, that footprint on India and then the submarine footprint as well. But actually the surface of our planet is kind of peppered with these, the evidence of this past volcanic activity. So you can see here, the red ones are the, are the ones that, that came out on the continent. So they, they, they were uh, subaerial, they, they were into, into, the, into the atmosphere. And then you've also got these enormous oceanic plateaus that actually erupted under the waves. Um, and I just wanted to draw your attention to a few of them here because I'm going to come back to them. So we've got the uh, Siberian traps about 250 million years ago, covering this enormous area of, uh, of, of northern, northern Russia. And if you ever get the chance, I know it seems like a kind of pipe dream at the moment, but I, want, I, I remember vividly flying from London to Tokyo uh, on a day flight once and getting a window seat, just staring out for what felt like hours at this, the amazing kind of trap topography, these layers of lava flows as I flew over Siberia. Um, another one I want to, we've talked about the Deccan, and another one I want to draw your attention to is this, this Central Atlantic magmatic province, so the camp here, which is about 200 million years ago, it was erupted. And it's actually been torn apart, so you now find it on three continents together, and perhaps that uh, that give you a clue about what the, what the arrangement of the continents looked like uh, that far back in geological time. But it's now found in South America, North America, um, and Northern Africa as well. So uh, these are just some of the examples that we have, and I could go on and talk through uh, many of the others. Um, but let's take a step back a second and just uh, orientate ourselves and I think about how, the, how this sort of fits in with different styles of volcanism uh, that we might actually have some, some knowledge of. So really volcanism exists on an entire spectrum of, 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 kind of, of, of explosivity or size. So, um, when I was talking earlier about sitting in the volcanic plume from Messiah Volcano, here's a, another picture of Messiah Volcano, that's kind of right down on what I call the everyday volcanism end of the scale. So the thing about volcanoes like Messiah, or this is Volcano Volcano in the Aeolian Islands uh, just off Sicily, these, these volcanoes are pumping out gas um, and particles into the atmosphere every single day of the year. This, if you, if you went to Masai today, it would be, it'd be doing something very much like this. So it doesn't really make the news. It's just part of the background activity. And actually it's part of the background activity that kind of maintains our atmosphere, if you like, rather than, rather than perturbing it. If we step it up a bit, we go to these, uh, so this is Hawaii now, this is the 2018 activity of fissures on Hawaii. 
So you see that you can have volcanoes that go through periods of much heightened activity, even though Hawaii um, it was erupting since the 1980s. Actually, it's, it's, it's quiet now uh, after this episode, but you can have fluctuating everyday activity as well. And then stepping up, this is Etna. You might recognize this as this is my, my current backdrop um, at the volcano, which again is, is pumping out gas in everyday activity, but then also has these, these sporadic eruptions like this one here in 2001. And then you get to much larger types of volcanic activity. So this is Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, which scattered ash all over North America. Um, and, uh, and, and these sorts of eruptions here are like, sp uh, they're sporadic. So you might have Mount St. Helens has been quiet now for years and years and years, but every one or 200 years, you'll have one of these much bigger eruptions that puts out lots of material, but then is quiet for, for a long period of time. And then we get into these scales of activity that we haven't seen in historical times. So I've talked about this as the Columbia River basalts from uh, 17 million years ago. But there's also, as uh, Campbell already alluded to, super eruptions. So this is the footprint of Toba volcano in Indonesia. So this is about 100 uh, kilometers across, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. And this last erupted about 75,000 years ago. Uh, this is a sort of nested caldera system, so different footprints there. So we go, these are, these are very, very rare events on this end of the scale, but when they happen, they, uh, they really perturb the planet in a really big way. And one of the things I'm very interested to do really is to understand Vulcan, the impacts of volcanism on our planet right across this scale. So how we time average and how we deal with kind of short-term versus long-term effects of all these different types of activity. So how do volcanoes, have, what, do they, what do they bring to the surface? What do they, how do they change the environment? How do they impact on our planet? So some of the things might be uh, quite obvious. We've already talked about lava flows, for example. So they're putting out lava flows down the sides of the volcano or over the scale of a province, uh, in the case of large igneous provinces. Um, but those are, those are quite localized effects. There's also different types of flows. You can get pyroclastic flows that some of you might have heard of. Um, Explosive volcanism also puts out ash. We talked about ash in the IFAC, at the Yerkut eruption, so broken up bits of rock. Um, and these can be uh, blown away by the winds and are really blown quite a long way away from the volcano. So you remember the ash uh, coming out of the uh, IFAC, at the Yerkut in Iceland, was sort of scattering over much of the Northern Hemisphere, depending on the wind direction. Um, so in my, in my little cartoon here, these are our ash particles being put out. But volcanoes also emit a whole cocktail of different gases. And some of these gases are quite reactive in, in Earth's environment. Um, so the, the dominant gas that comes out in most volcanic plumes is actually water. And I guess this shouldn't be too much of a surprise given how much water there is uh, on our planet in general. But the thing about water, although a lot comes out of volcanoes, our atmosphere is actually quite used to having very variable amounts of, of water in it. Uh, I don't know what the weather's been like in Glasgow recently, but uh, certainly over the weekend in Oxford, we had an awful lot of water in our atmosphere. But the, the, the atmosphere is used to having lots of water and, and very, very changeable amounts of it. The second most common gas is often carbon dioxide. Um, and obviously that can have well rehearsed effects in terms of the greenhouse emissions, acidification of the oceans um, and things like that. Then we get to the sulfur gases. So we get to sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, which tend to be the, the next most dominant. So sulfur dioxide smells a little bit like burnt matches and hydrogen sulfide is your kind of classic volcanic rotten egg smell. Um, and I was giving quite a graphic description of this once on uh, the BBC World Service and they kind of uh, dubbed me the connoisseur of volcanic gases. Uh, which was, um, which was, which was, uh, so maybe I should get some business cards printed up with that or something. But anyway, you have these, these two different gases that sulfur can exist on, depending on other parts of the chemistry. Um, and then we have the acidic halogen gases. So we've got hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, and small amounts of hydrogen bromide. And um, they can have effects such as acid rain, uh, but also especially with uh, hydrogen bromide here, they can destroy ozone and things like that. So there's a whole different manner in which these gases can interact with the environment. Um, 
And these gases interact with, with aqueous droplets. They can interact with the ash, but they can also uh, interact with little water droplets in the, in the volcano. And actually a lot of these water droplets will be formed from sulfuric acid, which is a, a, a reaction product of these sulfur gases in the volcanic plume. And we'll come back to the importance of that in a minute. And the really interesting thing about this cocktail, which I should mention as well, I'm gonna come back to, can also contain, contain trace metals. There's so some metallic species in there. I mean, really the volcanoes are kind of chucky out the periodic table, if you like. Um, but one of the interesting things is that the, this cocktail, it can kind of vary between different volcanoes. It can vary between different volcanoes at different times. And in fact, you can get different chemistry going on in plumes, even from the same volcano at the same time. So just to illustrate this, this is this image again from Etna in 2001. Um, and uh, here we have a really ash rich plume from the fissure eruption going on uh, just down slope from the summit here. So you can see this dark ashy plume. And then here from the Northeast crater, we have actually very much business as usual. We have our everyday degassing going on. And we have a very steam rich plume with some of this sulfuric acid aerosol giving it this sort of characteristic slightly bluey white um, uh, appearance just here. And then at the southeast crater here, we have this sort of mixture, this lighter ashy, so it's got some ash in it, but not as much as that, but more than that. So we, it's almost like we've kind of got a blending of, uh, of different uh, volcanic plumes there, and they each, they each have their own slightly different chemistry. So a lot of our understanding of um, volcanoes comes from observations that we can make in the present day and then we can use the rock record to kind of scale those up and to understand how they might have operated in the past and a really key eruption was this eruption here the uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption in June 1991 um, and uh, this is actually a picture this is a picture taken uh, a couple of days before the the climax the the, the main eruption itself but you can see it's already looking pretty fearsome even at this stage. Um, and it, uh, it basically was a, uh, a massive eruption column. It punched really high up into the atmosphere. So it got a column up to about 35 kilometers up into, up into our atmosphere. Um, just a relatively small on the scale of what we were talking about earlier in terms of large, large igneous provinces, just five cubic kilometers of lava or magma put out there but 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide punched up into our stratosphere. And it was something we call a roughly a one in a hundred year event. So that means that every hundred years we'd expect that on average to be one eruption of this sort of size all around the planet. And what was really critical about Pinatubo was it was the first eruption of its size that we'd had um, in, the, in the satellite era or the space era really. So for the first time we were really able to see what was going on with our planet. We knew, we knew that volcanoes could have global effects from eruptions like Tambora and Krakatoa going back in history. But this time we had eyes in the sky and could really understand. We could actually have data from actual human observations. So these are some images taken from the space shuttle. So the surface of the earth is down here and then we've got the darkness of space um, out there and you can see some cloud, the shapes of clouds here. So this was taken in 1984. So this is the so-called the sort of clean atmosphere. And you can see this sort of grade, grade, general gradation out into space. And this was taken August 1991, so just after the eruption in June. What you can see is this weird optical effect uh, up above the clouds, this sort of double layer here, which is caused by the volcanic emissions sitting in the stratosphere. And we could be a bit more uh, global and also technical in that. We could actually use satellites to, to understand what was going on. Um, so what we've got, here, what I have here are four images from a satellite, the SAGE-2 instrument, um, looking down on the planet. So this is mapped out, mapping out uh, what it can see in the planet. And what this instrument is looking at is something called optical depth. So what this is roughly is how hazy the stratosphere is. So how hazy the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere is. So if you've got cold colours here, it means it's, everything's nice and clear. And if you've got hot colours, everything's misty and hazy and a bit foggy um, and, uh, uh, and, and not, not very clean and see-through. See so you can see these dark colours just before the eruption. So this is a, a sort of average over 90, May to April um, 1991. So these dark colours, uh, nice clear, um, stratosphere that we can see through. 
Then after the eruption, uh, we've got this, this, this belt, this belt of haziness that has spread around the, uh, around the belly of our planet. So the, the eruption is around here in the Philippines and it's actually, it's already spread all the way east-west uh, around Earth's equator. And it was quite important that it was an equatorial eruption because that meant it could get into both hemispheres. And then you can see it, the, the, the haziness starts to spread north and, uh, and south. And by 1993, you've got this general, it's beginning to clean up a bit, but you've just got this general haziness uh, around the whole outside of the planet. And what's causing that haziness is actually the, the sulfur chemistry. The sulfur dioxide has got up into the stratosphere here, and then it's slowly reacted. It's slowly oxidized to form that sulfuric acid aerosol. So this fine mist, if you like, of particles. Um, and we know that uh, we know that that particles uh, into affect how how visible things are because that's when when we get cloudiness when we get the clouds sitting low down on a hilltop or sometimes um, on over a, a river or something like that we know that things get hazy and we can't see as far and this is basically what's happening in our stratosphere we're not able to see as far but it wasn't just uh, an issue for the stratosphere. Uh, it wasn't just haziness in the stratosphere. It had a, an effect on us down here in the, in the lower atmosphere, in the troposphere where we live. So this is now a temperature anomaly map from the summer after the Pinatuba eruption. So about 12 months uh, afterwards. Um, and what this is, is it's taken a kind of time average of about a decade of temperature data um, and then looked at how that year was different from, from that time average, that average of temperature data. And what I'm sure you'll have picked out is that it's mainly blue. So what we were mainly seeing was that that's, that summer of 1992 was actually colder than the previous 10 years. So on, on average, there's some quite interesting features which I won't have time to talk about today in terms of this, this hotter area over, over um, the, the Antarctic. But on the whole, it was, it was cooler. And the reason for that is that those, those little aerosol particles, those fine, fine little uh, particles sitting up in the stratosphere that are making it hazy, what they're actually doing is they're also reflecting some of the sun's energy back out into space. So, you know, the way that, that clouds can look bright and white if you shine a, shine a light on them, uh, it was, that's because they're reflecting uh, light energy back, back, up, back up at you. So if you've been an alien sitting on the moon, or city on Mars, and you were looking at the Earth. Um, after the Pinatubo the eruption, the Earth would have gone, got just that little bit brighter as it was reflecting more of the sun's energy back out into space. And what that meant was that we were coo that things were cooler on a, in a, on a global scale um, down on the surface of the planet. Um, but this type of volcanism, this the Pinatubo sort of type of volcanism, it gives us a lot of insight, but it's actually a very different style of volcanism um, to the sort of volcanism that we get in large igneous provinces. So I, you remember I already talked about lava flows being put out onto the planet. So it's much less about these enormous columns punching high up into the stratosphere, into the atmosphere. It's actually a lot more like a very, very large scale everyday type of volcanism, but the sort of a scaled up version over a, a massive area happening over, uh, over a prolonged period of time. So we can get other insights from going and studying uh, these, these different types of kind of lower key eruption on the present day planet. So I'm taking us back now to Nicaragua uh, and to Masaya volcano in Nicaragua. And um, this is where I was showed you the images before sitting up at the crater rim there. Um, and you can see this, this gas plume that we were looking in at last time, uh, coming out of the volcano there and then getting blown off downwind. This actually, um, you can probably guess, it's a photo taken from Managua Airport. Um, and I was actually leaving uh, early in the morning, I was feeling a little bit grumpy. I'd had to get off, get up at uh, about 4.30 in the morning to, to get there ready to board my flight. And it was also my birthday. So I was feeling particularly grumpy at the idea of spending most of my birthday at, in Miami airport in transit. But the volcano did treat me to this beautiful final view um, looking down at it. So I'm looking down southwards along the country here and the, the plume is, is blowing off towards the Pacific like this. And the thing you'll also notice here, so here's the volcano. It's not a very tall volcano. Um, we've also got quite a lot of highland 
uh, downwind of the volcano. So actually the closest uh, community to the volcano is this, this village here of El Panama, which is only about two kilometers. You can just see that's roughly where El Panama is, is there. And they are, they're, they're regularly fumigated by the volcano. So we can start to see the sort of impacts on the environment this type of persistent volcanic activity can have. And what you see here is this sort of characteristic yellowy scrubby ground that you get in the area uh, around El Panama. So uh, a lot of the Nicaraguan countryside is very lush and green. Um, and one of the main uh, cash crops that they grow is, is coffee but they can't grow coffee in this particular area uh, downwind of the volcano. You basically, this is some of the, the examples of the sort of damage that coffee plants can sustain, these leaf burns from the acidic, acidic gases. Uh, it's a very poor community in any case. This is sort of, this is one of their houses, but the, the volcano really adds to that in terms of the respiratory health, uh, but also like they can't use nails to hold their roofs together because they just rust through, it rusts uh, their, their pots and pans. Um, and they've had to adapt their agriculture so they can no longer, uh, they can no longer grow things like the cash crops like coffee, but actually they have found that uh, dragon fruit and pineapples survive very, very well in this environment. Um, in fact, some, some say better in this environment. So you can see the sort of impacts of the increased acidity from the volcano on this area. And then we can scale it up again. So Messiah is actually not putting out much lava and uh, is a relatively low flux of gas. But we can also go and have a look at perhaps the closest analogues to present day large igneous type eruptions. Um, and this is another photo I, I like very much of volcanic activity. So this is the Holorun eruption in Iceland, a little bit easier to say than I thought the Yerkut back in 2014 and 2015. Um, and this put out an enormous amount of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, but uh, still was a very much smaller scale than the uh, large Igbis provinces. It was only about a cubic kilometer of magma and uh, uh, over a six month period. Uh, particularly like this, this, this uh, amazing photo of the volcano with the Northern Lights in the background. And in this, this case, there is no connection between the two phenomena. Uh, but it does make the picture even more spectacular uh, than just the volcano on its own. So we're using, satell using satellites and ground-based measurements um, and also computer models. We were able to go and study these emissions from Iceland and understand more about the types of environmental processes going on um, in terms of this type of eruption that's much more analogous uh, to, uh, to large igneous provinces. But let's go back to the geological record. So that's sort of hopefully persuade you some of the reasons we might want to study uh, uh, study present day volcanism to understand the mechanisms that uh, for their effects uh, on the environment. If we go back to this plot again that I showed you already, you remember we've got this age, these geological time scales on both axes. Actually, um, I want to unpack this a little bit more because uh, actually later on in Vincent Courtier's later works, he did. Uh, change the labeling on this axis here but actually what we have on this this uh, in terms of all these different events here is quite a family of different types of activity so we've got these 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 uh, major mass extinction events we've got uh, the end Cretaceous the end of the dinosaurs and also the end Triassic and the end Permian um, but we've also got uh, some different types of event here so we've got minor extinction events and also um, environmental change events. So we've got a whole, um, a whole range of different environmental responses going on to these, these different uh, volcanic trap events on, on our planet. And I've labeled these major mass extinction events five, four and three, because actually they're, 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 they are three of the, the, big, the big five uh, mass extinction events. And if we home in on just those, those big five mass extinction events, I've now, um, put the geological, this is another version of the geological time scale. So we're going from present day to 600 million years ago now. So I stretched it out a little bit further into geological time. Um, we can think about this in a little bit more detail. So the geological time scale is something that kind of can you quite easily give you vertigo, I find. So the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Um, and just to kind of get a, 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 an idea for that, is if you um, you could sort of, if you put your arm out to the side and you imagine your shoulder is is four point five billion years ago, um, and your fingertips are present day, um, 
the time that we've been on the planet is just uh, actually if you took a nail file and drew it once across your your nails that would give you the kind of proportion of the geological time scale that that modern humans have been around so we're, we're really the the nail dust on this planet um and, uh, and most most of earth's history did not ha happen um without our without our involvement um how we're going to interact with it in the future is a different matter but if you take these big five the interesting thing is you can see that although the deccan traps as i sort of showed you earlier we have this impact of this uh, this meteorite impact um the other the, the other uh, big five uh the other four of the other big five mass extinction events basically line up with different types of trap volcanism so we've got the central atlantic magmatic province the siberian traps and then the Valais traps, which are also in Siberia. And then we start getting very much, very deep into, uh, into, into geological time. And we start to run the risk of basically losing part of the geological record in terms of the seafloors being subducted um, and continental collisions have destroyed other parts as well as of course, weathering as well. So there seems to be something going on, which the, although there's a lot of argument about the Deccan, um, there doesn't seem to be the same evidence that we found as yet anyway for asteroids hitting uh, at each of these points. So there's, some, there's, some, there's something going on in terms of a time coincidence. So um, we've actually had this idea of, uh, of, of mass extinction for quite a while. I found this one, this lovely sort of page in, the, um, in, a, in an old book, which you can actually get all online from John Phillips, who was, uh, who was actually a, uh, uh, a geologist working in Oxford. This is a picture of his statue in the Oxford uh, Natural History Museum, which is just a, a stone's throw away from, from my office um, when, I, when I'm working there. Um, and this is a, a page from his, one of his book, uh, basically um, back in 1860, which he generated just from looking at the, the British geological record. We're very lucky in the United Kingdom to have a very rich geological record. And even then he was able to spot two of, just by looking at uh, British fossils, was able to spot two of these major mass extinction events. So there's the end Cretaceous and the end Permian. So he uh, hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't picked up number four, but, uh, but he managed to get uh, those two in this very early plot. Um, and it's a rather wonderful book and it sort of quotes Latin, uh, Latin poets in it, which uh, we just don't write scientific papers like we used to, but so some people wax, others wane, um, and uh, ha talks about handing the torch of life from uh, individual to individual. Um, he actually, uh, his, his sort of method of hand handing the torch of life is a little bit maybe uh, um, unfortunate in that he seems to have um, passed away on, after having a very hearty dinner at All Souls College in Oxford and then tripping over a carpet and falling down the stairs. So uh, I think this ought to be, uh, this is a, a, a lesson to us all, but, uh, but uh, so, so uh, rather unfortunately a, uh, an untimely demise. So the, uh, if we zoom in, just have a think about what he was doing there when he was putting that data together in order to understand that mass extinction. So if we zoom in here on the end Triassic, so this is the time um, associated with the, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. Um, I just want to sort of draw us in on what the world looked like uh, at that time. So you remember I said that now we have deposits in North and South America and, uh, and Northern Africa as well. But this is because the continents were grouped together in a supercontinent um, at this period over at about 200 uh, million years old. So we had this massive province, this massive Central Atlantic magmatic province associated with the opening up of the central um, Atlantic as well by tectonic forces. Um, and we lost about 76% of all species. Um, so the way that works is in terms of, uh, in terms of actually understanding it is when you, when you go um, and look uh, through the strata, through the sedimentary record of geology, um, you go and you can look, you can step your way through an extinction event Basically, you, by looking at your pre-extinction ecosystem, which will be recorded in the fossils in the sedimentary rocks, um, and then you'll find that you have very few or no fossils during the extinction horizon. Um, and then you start to see a recovery phase afterwards when different uh, but relatively low diversity of species start coming back. And then the full recovery, the post-extinction phase, when you have 
a, 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 a full ecosystem again, but it's a different ecosystem to what you had. Um, and you can, you, can, you can go to places, you don't have to get on a plane to see some of these amazing rocks. So this is just to give you an example, this is down in Dorset, just near Lyme Regis. So you just go down to Lyme Regis and uh, onto the beach and walk to your, to your right. And you can basically walk through a, a mass extinction event. So you go from these, these lighter Triassic rocks here up to these, uh, these, these, these layered Jurassic rocks above. And this is the end Triassic mass extinction here. Um, and you can go to these fantastic ammonite pavements just there, and that's this sort of richness recovery phase. Another way people now find out about it, which wasn't uh, open to the early pioneers of this, was, is actually to drill into these sedimentary sequences um, and have a look at the biology that we have going in. So the biology, the, the extinction events themselves are recorded in the, in, the, in the sedimentary rocks, and they're recorded by looking for these changes in biology. But the issue is when we're thinking about looking at something like camp volcanism, so Central Atlantic Magmatic Province volcanism, they, these, these, uh, these, these lava flows are not recorded in the same columns. And actually I specifically chose the camp because uh, we're quite lucky with that in that sometimes they are. So we have more information with this than most of the other extinction events. We've got some columns like this one, Newark, Argana and Fundy marked on this map. Well, we actually have the basaltic lava flows from the large igneous province interleaving with the sedimentary record that's telling us about the biology. And this is, this is sort of what it looks like in the field. So you've got these red sedimentary sequences, and then you can see this massive lava flow through here with some trees for scale on top. Uh, you can see it again here. So this is in the Fundy Basin um, up in number six up here in, uh, in Canada right there. So in the camp stratigraphy, we actually do have some of these. You can see one, uh, the, the numbers here, one, two, three. Um, uh, these are all different lava flows that have been recorded in the sedimentary sequence. But generally, to actually build up a picture of what's going on all around the province, we're going around the planet, we're picking up chunks of lava, and then we're looking at the radioactive isotopes, the radioactive decay in some of these crystals in each of these chunks of lava and we're seeing how old they are. So we're taking chunks of rock from distinct places in the planet and trying to match them up with the, these, these sedimentary records of what's going on with the biology and what's going on with the environment. So these sedimentary records here, we've got this, this line here, this mass extinction event. And if we go around the, um, we go around and we look at all the different parts of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, we get this enormous range of dates in terms of what was going on. And all of these dates have, have quite significant error bars on them. So what's quite tricky here is this, for us to really understand cause and effect. So if we have this horizon here, where we've got the, uh, where we've got the, the extinction event going on, um, then we've got these, these events here where, where the, the, the dates captured in the lavas that could, for example, be this, this flow here, which is the uh, um, Amalal Sill, Basically, it could be before it was going off or it could be after, we're not really sure. And again, here with the North Mountain Basalt up in Fundy, um, it could be going on up, it could be going before the extinction event, so it could be causing it, but actually there's also uh, equal probability really that most of it was happening afterwards. So we get this very complex picture that's very hard to understand cause, to use to understand cause and effect. And this is where the second part of actually sitting in a volcanic plume uh, can help us to understand um, what's going on in these ancient deposits with these ancient volca volcanoes. So these are these are my these, this is a picture of me taking samples at the top of Mount Etna. So uh, this is one of the the Boca, the the mouths of the volcano uh, at the top here. Uh, and here I am wearing my please see wearing my hard hat, gas mask, and a sun hat just to be fully protected from uh, the extremes of the environment. Um, Actually, I went to give a talk at the Lapworth Museum in Birmingham recently, and to advertise their talk, they, they use this picture, which I think is uh, probably from Vesuvius or Etna from their collection. So, uh, so I'm, I'm now slightly intrigued by the idea of trying to get in this outfit and go on field work, which strikes me as extremely impractical. But I thought it was quite a funny photo that they've used to advertise my talk. Um, and what I'm doing here on uh, the top of Etna, and I'll show you a little bit more about it in a second, is actually measuring volcanic mercury. 
So mercury is an element. Uh, it is the most, uh, the most volatile, the most uh, uh, of all the metal elements in the periodic table. It's the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. Uh, some of you like me might have been at school where we used to use mercury thermometers in, in physics experiments. So I don't know if any of you remember when you broke one of those and they had some little ball, silver balls would scatter off uh, and you should have to get the sulfide kit out to, to sort it out. Um, it's a toxic, with the reason we were studying it from volcanoes, it's a, it's a toxic metal and it bioaccumulates in the food chain. So there's advice, for example, pregnant women are, suggest, are, are advised not to eat too much tuna fish. And the reason for that is because mercury can accumulate in tuna up the, the food chain. Um, it's, it's a volatile metal. What I mean by that is that it, a significant proportion of it will exist as a gas. So there's actually mercury in the background air all around us. So if you take a ni nice deep breath of, of air into your lungs right now, um, up in Glasgow, as, as in Oxford, there'll be a couple of nanograms of mercury in that, uh, in that breath that we've just taken. Um, and volcanoes are a major source of, of, of mercury. So actually what, what I started off during my PhD doing was to answer that question is about how much mercury comes out of volcanoes, but also about how it comes out. So mercury mainly, because volcanoes are very hot, mercury mainly comes out as a gas. And what that means is it doesn't fall out of the atmosphere with the, the ash and the particles. It tends to be really widely dispersed in the atmosphere. And all these things make it very interesting in terms of whether we can use it as a fingerprint in the sedimentary record for these, um, for these large igneous provinces. So I just wanted to show you a few photos from the field. This is um, sort of a, a little mini uh, insight into one of our field trips going up Mount Etna. So this is the view from this is the view from one of the places that we've stayed. So uh, looking up, you can see the top of the volcano. Lots of lovely volcanic gas to go and uh, go and sample. Um, so we dri you drive up to the top of the road, so the dri the, that's the, the top of the road, so it ends about there. Um, and you drive up, uh, my colleague Sandro from Palermo University, there I am, pack all the equipment into rucksacks, um, take your gas masks and helmets, and there we are tre trekking off up into the volcanic haze up at the top of the volcano. Um, you can see us here going through sort of gas, it's carrying a, uh, an instrument there. Um, some, sometimes the road's a little bit rocky and tricky. Here we are kind of skirting along the edge of the Bocca Nova um, on, on the summit there. It's one of the, the guides up in front. Um, and here we are doing, doing sampling on the crater rim. Again, we're setting up instruments to run. Here we're trying to change over the filters on an instrument in a clean manner up at the top of the volcano, which is very, very tricky. So uh, can't really work out. It's quite windy in this shot. Here's uh, Andrew and Sandra having a bit of a rest while the samplers run. Um, and sometimes it's very, very nice on the top of Etna and you can have a rest and other times it's absolutely miserable. And you can see here the clouds come down, the hail's coming in, it's probably sleeting or snowing. Um, we've got to stay there until the samples are finished. So we're all sort of hunkered down at the top there uh, and feeling uh, relatively sorry for ourselves. Um, and this is what, these are the sorts of measurements we're doing. We're, we're basically measuring different types of mercury metal coming out of the volcanoes. Just we've got some uh, things here. We've got little gold traps that we pump bits of the plume, uh, some of the plume through. It's just attached to a pump there. Um, and uh, it, uh, it collects the mercury on these little gold beads. And then we have other traps that we trap, uh, trap it in the particle phase, the, the, in those volcanic particles there. Uh, and then we're also looking at some of the other, this is something called a, a glass denuder, um, which we use to look at some of the other types of mercury chemistry coming out. And this is this is really one of the least practical pieces of equipment to take up a volcano ever. You can see this sort of delicate glass tube um, and several of them have got broken, which is uh, which is very frustrating when you spent, um, just spent many hours trying to get a really good sample. And we can use real time instruments as well. This is a special spectrometer that we can use to, uh, to, to actually find out in real time every second how much mercury is coming out of the volcano. So how can we use this then to answer some of those questions about cause, of, cause and effect that we want to answer in the geological record? So the thing we can do is that we've got this massive uh, province of volcanism going off. So we're back at the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province here 200 years, a million years ago. 
Um, and you can see that there could be activity going on all the way around this province, or it could be going off here and not there, or there and not here. So we don't know when most of the volcanism was happening, and we don't know when that peak in volcanism relates to the, uh, the, the extinction event itself. And um, you remember that's because of those big chunky error bars on the, on the rock measurements, on the dating of the rocks themselves. But what we can actually do now is to run the chemistry of the sediments. So we can look at the very sediments, um, the very sediments that record the changes in biology. So the very sediments that record things like the actual mass extinction events. We can go and look and see how much mercury those sediments have in them. And because volcanoes are a major source of natural mercury, so there's, there are some other sources, but they're one of the main ones. And because it's, it's a gas, normally a gas, so it gets a really long way from the volcano. Because of those things, we can actually go and look at sediments from all over the world, um, sedimentary columns, and actually see if we can see the fingerprint of the volcano. So I'm just going to show you this one data here. These are the carbon isotopes that give us a, the change in the carbon cycle that accompanies things like mass extinction events. And this is from a core taken at this site B in Austria. And what you can see is we get this, this big spike in the mercury here. So this is this red line around the end Triassic extinction event here. So we've got this, this uh, extinction here. And the thing that was really exciting for me when I saw this is because with the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, we actually have this interleaving of sediments with, um, with some of the lava flows. We could actually kind of almost tell which, which lava flow of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province this came from. And it was probably this, this lower high atlas flow, which basically just sits around this, uh, this, this extinction event right here. So what was quite amazing for me was to imagine the fact that this, this flow here in Morocco that was, uh, was, was erupted about 200 million years ago, pushed out a load of mercury that traveled uh, a significant distance around the planet to, this, to be, be deposited in this sediment core here in Austria, which was then sampled, dug up by, by, by humans and brought back to my lab in Oxford. And that, those, those atoms of mercury were released as a little puff through my instrument that allows me to measure this. And this gives us insight that this was actually a really big gas emission um, around the time of the end Triassic extinction. So this, this is something that we're working on right now and we're hoping will we'll yield new insights into these associations between large igneous provinces and uh, mass extinction events. And the other thing we're interested in as well is that, you know, I said earlier, this, we don't know that we've got an open question is this Endor division extinction? Was it caused by something else, or is it just that we've lost the, the, the evidence of the volcanism around this time because it's so far back in the geological record? And there's lots that we need to understand before we can kind of really interrogate that. But actually, maybe we can use mercury uh, in some of the sediments. If we can understand the ocean, the chemistry of the oceans going on around then, if we can understand how the atmosphere was behaving and how mercury chemistry has happened, perhaps we could understand if we can see a mercury signal here, whether it tells us something about the cause of this, this most enigmatic of mass extinction events. So I'm going to end it there. Um, what I really hope that I've convinced you is that there's many ways that volcanoes can affect our environment. We can actually learn a lot about the impacts, the environmental impacts of volcanism of the whole geological record of the whole uh, of the history of our planet by looking at volcanic processes today and by sitting in, um, in, in volcanic plumes and, and making measurements. Um, and so I really hope I've shown a sort of link from volcanic events to, to mass extinction events uh, as, my, uh, as, as the title of my talk suggested. Thank you very much. We, we've got a few questions starting to, to build up for you, Tamsin. I'll just try and get them into some, um, some sort of order here. But there's an interesting one from the uh, early part of your talk. Um, Paul is asking, is it possible that an asteroid impact could actually have set off the volcanic activity at the end of the Cretaceous? What are your thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, so, so people have suggested this. Um, I think the... the the problem with it is that the volcano, the, the 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 volcanism was going on before the asteroid hit. So if we look at the iridium layer in the geological record, 
um, and we look at the million years uh, that the, the Deccan was going on for, actually the Deccan had been going on for a very significant period of time before the asteroid hit. Now, of course, when you get a big, um, when you get a, 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 an impact of that scale, um, you know, it would shake the planet up. You get a lot of vibrations going on around the planet. Um, and it is possible that that would have you know, accelerated the pace a little bit of the volcanism. We might have had a slightly higher statistical number of other volcanoes going off around uh, around the world. Uh, but I, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as as pure cause and effect in, in the most in the most sort of black and white and straightforward way. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, now, Tony Burton is asking a question here, and it, it's it's to do with um, with cooling rate, really. Uh, I think he's I'm interpreting here. I think he's interested in in perhaps things like geochem geothermal energy, but he's asking about the, the rate of cooling. Um, does it cool as, you know, does it take as long as um, hundreds of millions of years to cool? Is it renewed? Um, would you like to talk about the uh, rate of cooling? Well, um, so, so it's like, there's this, I guess there's, maybe not immediately clear if you're talking about lava flows on the surface of the planet. If you're talking about geothermal energy, you're talking about kind of things going on inside the crust. Right. Um, of course, the, the heat of the planet um, is you know, Earth's, Earth's internal heat, which is fundamentally what drives volcanism, is, is ongoing. Um, some of it's left over from primordial heat, from, uh, from the heat that it had when, it, when the planet accreted. But then we've also got a bunch of... Um, different radioactive decay chains going on inside the rocks, inside the earth, uh, which then release, release energy and, uh, and, and maintain the, the earth's inner heat. So then when you get uh, magmas created by different processes, so the, you know, there, are, there are a number of different processes. There's the subduction processes where you have essentially uh, water being released into the mantle and that changes the, the chemistry of the mantle which then causes it to, to melt, changes the, the, the melting point um, and, and that can create magmas but then at, uh, at mid-ocean ridges like Iceland and hot spots also like Iceland actually you've got lots going on there, um, it's because you've got a reduction in pressure on the, on the, on the rocks or a hot, hot, hot mantle rising up to a lower pressure. Um, and so it's that change in pressure a bit like, you know, trying to, I don't know, maybe no one, if you ever tried to cook, uh, cook rice or pasta at altitude, you get a kind of horrible gloop uh, because the, the, that cha it changes the boiling point of water. So, uh, so that similar thing happens with changing pressure um, on, uh, on the mantle there. So once you've got magmas, then those magmas are sort of fresh, hot stuff at about a thousand degrees or more. And, and it's that, that's that 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 new heat energy, if you like, is then transported to the surface of the planet. Um, and when you've got geothermal energy, you're you're tapping into that, but that's that's sitting insulated inside the Earth's crust, so it'll it'll cool very slowly, and and then potentially also be renewed by new pulses of magma coming up from deeper inside the planet. Thanks, Tamsin. There's a, a, another little questions come in. Um, I guess relating to, to, to magma and the, the internals of the, the earth. The, the question from Michael Bolton is to do with the re renewal. In, it, obviously, the, the, um, the gases coming off, the emissions, the particles um, are coming out of the earth. Um, is, the, is the pool that's left sufficient to keep sustaining that? Um, how, so how is the scale of, of eruption relative to the, uh, the remainder that's in the earth, I think, is the question. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, um, the, this is, this, I guess it's sort of related to the point about the fact that it's not like a, it's not a big pool of molten rock that we have inside yeah. the earth. Most of the earth is solid apart from the, apart from the outer core. So the magmas are being generated from the, the massive um, reservoir that is the mantle and then finding their way up to the surface or stalling actually inside the Earth's crust as well. Um, and similar with the gases as well, the gases 
are, uh, are, are coming from that massive re reservoir in the mantle, if you like, or being cycled through. So if you've got subduction zones where you have a plate going down, um, some of the water is, is coming from being taken down uh, in, on, in the, the sediments in the hydrated oceanic crust that goes down into the mantle and then they find their way back, back up and similarly with, with elements like chlorine. Thanks, Tamsin. A question here from, from Neil Metcalf, um, which is really, I think, relevant to your slides of the Pinatubo eruption. And he's asking, it's striking that the, the photo from the space station showed that the volcanic eruption created a very sharply defined band in the stratosphere. And he's asking why the bands appeared to be so sharp. Yes, that, that would be the slide there, I think. Why yeah. are they yeah, it's, uh, um, I think it's largely a, a sort of optical effect. So it's to do with the way that the light is behaving. The, uh, I think, I think uh, from, you know, and also because you're seeing this in limb view, which means sunrise or sunset to, to uh, uh, in, in kind of normal language, I guess. Um, so, so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit similar to, I suppose, it's a, it's a, it's a different sort of cloud. And if you think about how sometimes clouds can kind of, do this thing where they they kind of have the the darker edges or the lighter edges depending on what angle the the, the light is hitting it you can get these quite uh different effects and also what background um what the, what's going on in the background atmosphere as well so you sort of got you have got this kind of um uh this 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 sort of line sitting here which kind of maps onto this this line about here so we've got background optics going on as as well as the uh, the the fine mist of the aerosol haze optics as well, um, but do take a you can find these photo, these photos are all on the NASA website and there's quite a long commentary about them, so so I do urge you though it's a wonderful resource um, so I do urge you to go and have a uh, have a nosy you should be able to find them relatively easily I think it's the NASA Earth Observatory website or something like that. Um, but there's more photos similar to this, um, and uh, it's a really interesting resource. So do go and have a, a look at it if that's piqued your interest. Thanks, Amazon. We've got a nice sweeping question from Dermot yeah. Kennedy here. Um, and he's asking, how important has volcanism been as an underlying force of history? Um, effects on famine, plague, migration, war, and how likely in the near future? <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> going for I, think, a while, I, think. I was going to say, I think we've got, I think we've got some slightly different forces of history going on just now. But <laughs> the, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, it's really, it's a really, really interesting one. I mean, sometimes it's hard enough in earth sciences to tease out cause and effect. So then we, when we start layering human history on top of that, causing out, uh, teasing out cause and effect can be even more, uh, or even more tricky. Uh, I mean, um, you can read all sorts of really fascinating uh, things about this. So there's sort of, uh, I was reading the other day about a, a sort of theory about the link between the Minoan eruption in Santorini um, and the, the, you know, the exodus, the, the, uh, the, the uh, links with Egypt and the ten pla the plagues of the biblical times. So, so you know, there, but it, but it's very, very difficult to actually kind of, well, in that case, draw the dates closely enough because we've got a, some pat, patchy records on on both sides. Uh, in more recent times, there's some links between things like the Larki eruption in Iceland again and um, uh, impacts on 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 harvests and, uh, um, and and food supplies and things like that. And you know, of course, you know we 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 know that we know that uh, big political unrest can be triggered by an increase in the price of bread or something like this. But it's often quite difficult to draw a really clear line of of cause and effect from the volcano going off to a, a particular event in human history, unless the event in human history involves actually a direct interaction with the the volcano. Um, but yes, I, I mean. Um, future events. I mean, I don't really like to speculate. We've got enough doomsday scenarios going on already uh, right now, I would say. But uh, but yes, yeah, certainly a very large scale eruption is always, is always going to have um, some, some, some sort of geopolitical aspect to it as well. Could you I mean, extend that question a little bit into 
work that's going on in predictability and perhaps unpredictability of, of volcanism? Yes. So, I mean, um, I, sometimes when I give talks to me of this, I sort of get somebody who will ask, When's, what's the next volcano that's going to go off? Um, and I'll never be drawn on that because, it, well, first of all, it'd be wrong to say, to say it out loud, even if you, because you have to be very responsible about how you communicate uh, those sorts of uh, those sorts of predictions. Um, you can say which volcanoes going off, um, you know, which are, you don't need to be a volcanologist to look at the big volcanoes that are closest to massive centres of population and be able to say that if they went off very suddenly, then that would have a, a big uh, a big impact. In terms of predictability, we do have, um, there's, a, there's an, always a sort of interesting contrast with earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, and with volcanoes, we generally uh, know where they are, uh, not always, but occasionally, occasionally a new one pops up. But, uh, but we, we you know, generally know where they are and we, we know where to, we, we do have, um, the ability to monitor them and look for changes. So I, I, it's a slightly different talk and I could probably talk for about 50 minutes on the subject as well. Um, but there's lots of different techniques that we use. Um, some of the challenges about it can be time scale. So you know you can often look at a volcano and say, yes, that's going to erupt, but you, you, it, it's whether you can put, uh, it's going to erupt in the next two weeks or whether it's going to erupt in the next two or 20 years, which is, which is a problem. So for the volcano, if you think about how long their lifespan is, two weeks, two years, 20 years, that is kind of all in the, it's kind of, that's kind of a, a same chunk of time for, for them. But our lifespans are so very, very much shorter. So that's a really key difference for us. So we're kind of interacting with an entity that exists on a really different time scale. But one of the most exciting things I think for me at the moment is, is the space-based measurements that we can make which uh, which which again is, is really a whole a whole new talk but like for example we can now watch the the earth change in shape on the kind of centimeter scale um, and we can do this with all the world we well not all but um, a large number of the world's volcanoes and this is actually kind of allowing us to build up data sets and understandings uh, understanding of kind of the um the whole po the whole sort of population behavior of volcanoes rather than just having a few that we understand really well thanks very much damson so we're not going to get a we're not going to pin you down to three weeks on wednesday now are we no, no. that's right a, a rainy tuesday in november <laughs> <laughs> no i've got a uh uh a more technical question here perhaps from from david webster and I think he's, he's uh, thinking about your uh, slide showing the mass extinctions and the questions or the unknowns about the Ordovician period. And he, his question is, there was a lot of mountain building and presumably volcanism during the Ordovician in Scotland. Are there any studies on links to extinctions then? So, uh, so I mean, the, the, yes, uh, the, there, uh, there's volcanism going on throughout the geological period. Uh, but it kind of needs to go a bit over and above to 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 become one of these 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 net large igneous provinces. So yes, there will be volcanism going on around the globe um, at times, absolutely in uh, some of the beautiful volcanism that you have not too far from yourself. Mm. Um, but uh, but but it's it's about whether you've got one of these one of these these massive uh, prolonged uh, province events going off, which is which is which takes the whole kind of uh, planetary average up for a million years, if you like, in terms of how much has been put out onto the surface of the planet. Okay. A question here from John Rowland. How well do we understand the extent to which subsea volcanic activity has and is currently impacting the temperature and chemical constituents of our ocean? Or in other you know words. What, I, I, absolutely. So, um, I've always Thank wanted you. to go and study. So I'm just trying to find, um, I've just wanted to get a map up. I've always wanted to go and study submarine volcanoes, but they're even more difficult to get to than uh, the, uh, the sub-aerial yeah. uh, sub volcanoes. So uh, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating question. Um, the thing we have been doing recently um, with the, uh, so, so we, do have, we do have understanding of some of the chemistry. So for example, for mercury, uh, we've got some uh, 
cruise we've we've got cruisers that go across the ocean so just for example there's a cruisers that go across the atlantic uh, and take chemical data they they send they send the in instruments down to the bottom of the sea and come back again and they uh, they collect the samples and they analyze them so you can then plot out what effect the the mid atlantic ridge which is sort of running uh, running along like this um, all the volcanism in the mid-Atlantic ridge, you can actually have a look at the sort of chemistry, effect of the chemistry and the temperature and things like that, that the mid-Atlantic ridge is happening. And it's worth saying that, you know, most of the, the world's volcanoes are under the sea. So um, it does really change. I mean, so the, the, the ocean is an enormous kind of buffer, if you like. So it does sort of change in terms of, uh, and it circulates in a very different way to the atmosphere. So it does. It does sort of rather change um, the the immediate impact that that these types of volcanism have on the planet. But we have been looking as well at the impacts of these um, submarine volcanics, so the Ontong Java, for example, and the Caribbean. So we've also been looking at the geological record at some of the uh, some of the ways that these have impacted the biology and ecosystems of the world. So it's quite interesting because we can use different elements with different lifetimes in the atmosphere and the oceans to try and kind of tease out, if you like, um, how far the sort of chemical horizons of the volcanism are getting in different cases. The question goes on slightly just to, you're touching on it, but um, John is asking, can the effects of subsea volcanic activity be, be separated out from those of global warming? Um, well, the sub, I mean, the thing about the subsea volcanism, I guess, is that it, it, go, it's, it goes on, it's been going on you know, over the geological time scale. So what we're seeing in terms of global warming at the moment uh, is, is a perturbation. It's not, it's not part of the background. So the, the effects of submarine volcanism really are part of the background uh, because there's no, there's no evidence um, from any source that, that that has changed in the last 200 years, uh, whereas there's plenty of evidence, or several hundred years, but there's plenty of evidence that our, our planet is changing in a bunch of other ways on that time scale. Um, slip in a little practical question here from Pat Monaghan. Um, I think she's been a bit concerned about you getting too close to the edge of some of these <laughs> Craters and asking, can drones now be used to get samples of gases from volcanic craters? Yes, yes, they can. So we do we do use drones. Um, and uh, um, I was on a the last field trip I did was to Stromboli volcano in Italy, uh, and that was using drones to to sample the the plume there. Um, I would sort of emphasize that uh, the the uh, the 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 volcanoes that I go to study are are kind of by definition a particular type of volcano. So right on the can't remember where the, yeah right at this end of my my explosivity spectrum. You know these are the most uh, the 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 safest approach that you can possibly make. And even there, I'm I'm sort of I, I would never um, for example abseil down into the crater of Messiah, although I know people who have. Um, and, uh, and when you're up on the top of Mount Etna, you're always there with the, the local scientists and with the most up-to-date information about the, the activity state of the volcano. Thanks, Tamsin. A uh, question here from John Tweedy. Uh, it's touching back on the, the mercury question. Do you find that mercury emissions vary with different eruptions and do you find different proportions from as he puts it, everyday eruptions compared with those associated with mass extinctions? Well, I suppose this, the, the, that's a really interesting question. And the trick, the, 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 the reason it's a really interesting question, and I'm glad I've got this slide up, is it sort of relates to the previous question, actually, is that we can safely make mercury measurements of this, this volcano, of Messiah volcano, this volcano here. We can safely sit at the edge of the volcano there and make some mercury measurements. But we can't sit in Mount St Helens plume, um, and we can't sit. So we can't sit in these really ash-rich explosive plumes and make and make measurements of the mercury coming out. So we actually have less information about the mercury emissions in this type of eruption here. 
um, and whether they are less because uh, because uh, whether they're more because the gas is coming from deeper in the system, whether there's any interaction with the ash. There's there's lots of open questions which are kind of um, we're limited in what measure, measurements we can make. But actually, in terms of the large igneous provinces, it is probably more like this Hawaii type of activity and this uh, Messiah type of activity um, that, 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 they, that characterize them actually, rather than these, these massive silica rich explosive eruptions. So large igneous provinces tend to be basaltic, which is the kind of less uh, chemically changed end of, of magmas. So they're the more runny magmas like on Hawaii and Messiah. Uh, and Etna, for example. Um, so actually we're sort of fortunate in that sense and I think our, our lack of ability to make significant measurements up at this end here of the explosivity um, probably isn't the, the uh, as much of a problem as it would be perhaps for a super eruption, for example, in terms of mercury. Thanks, Amazon. I think we've got time for just another couple of quick questions here. Um, Another one from David Webster, a very specific question here. Was volcanic activity responsible for the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum? Um, possibly, yes. So that was around the time that the North Atlantic Igneous Province was coming out. So, yeah, this is one of the, uh, I can't remember if it's on um, Vincent's um, compilation here. Yes, it's so it's uh, it's it's this this it's hidden unfortunately now. I'll see if I can find it in the later one, but yeah, there is this association um, with the the North Atlantic. Okay, and a question again, going back to the example of the Pinatubo eruption, and the question is, what sort of effect on global warming? is a one in 100 year event likely to have yeah so it slowed down global warming so if you look at the if you look at the the average record you've got this kind of you've got this steadily steady increase unfortunately and the year around 1991 92 93 is this flattening off um slight uh, a slight increase i think in 92 i can't remember it's a while since i looked at it but yeah so i mean it's led some people to suggest that we should be putting uh, aerosol up in our stratosphere uh, in order to combat man man-made global warming. I think it's uh, I think it's a bad idea myself. I think that uh, you could have a lot of um, unintended consequences. So we did we saw things like changes in rainfall patterns after the Pinatubo eruption that were uh, relatively subtle. Uh, but if you got things wrong, you know you 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 could uh, risk triggering inundations or droughts uh, around the planet, just to take one example of unintended consequences. But of course, it might not be a direct trigger, but it would be hard to prove cause and, direct cause and effect with something as complicated as the, uh, the, the, annual, the annual weather. So, so you might end up with, uh, with international disputes arising from that. Thanks, Tamsin. I think that there's I'm being possibly corrected over an earlier question, Tony Burton's question about cooling and um, whether, whether that's right or wrong. You might like to, could, could we ask you just to comment on the, the renewal of heat um, within the Earth's core? What is it, can we explain for the audience, what is it that keeps heat uh, regenerating in the Earth? Really? So it's, it's been it's been regenerated, as I said. So some of it is residual from accretion from when the planet was formed. But but uh, but then it's the it's the fact you've got things like uranium series, uh, um, uh, uranium. You've got radioactive isotopes that decay, um, and when they decay, they release energy, and uh, and that keeps the the Earth warm. So you know that um, radioactivity can have a very long half life. And we've got a series of different decay chains that that keep the keep the inside of the earth hot. It won't be hot forever, um, but but it's not probably our most immediate concern right now. <laughs> okay, Damson, thanks very much. You refer to energy there. Well, we we admire your energy getting through the last hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> thanks very much for a, a brilliant talk. There's been a good number of comments about it. Uh, superbly illustrated. Very relevant. And um, I, I 
picked out of your talk. I just uh, loved some of your phrases, which will um, stay with me. I love the, the uh, picture of volcanoes, as you put it, chucking out the periodic table. I think that's a great one. Uh, that's a new way of looking at volcanoes. And um, you also, very important and touching on some of the last questions there, how you illustrated the fact that a, a volcano, which is in the news today, tomorrow, for a couple of weeks, has such a lasting effect on, on the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere and, and the temperatures of the Earth. Um, excellent demonstration of that. And uh, just to draw it to conclusion, I also loved your, it put us in perspective, didn't it? Your, your example of humankind as the nail dust on the planet. <laughs> it was all, put us all, it put everything into perspective for us. Can I thank you very much on behalf of the society for a brilliant talk this evening. It's been most stimulating. I'm sure there'll be lots of chat amongst people for uh, days to come as a result of it. Thank you very much, Tamsin. That's okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye now.